without further ado, first we're going to hear from our experts, and then we'll set up our panel and have a nice conversation about the subject matter. And during all of this, I'm sure you'll, have, you'll enjoy your lunch at, uh, at one point. Uh, first, uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, uh, invite uh, our two experts. Uh, first, of course, uh, my uh, colleague, my former colleague, actually, uh, Chris, uh, uh, and, and formerly with the Price School, uh, now the Director of Research and Strategy at uh, Greater Sacramento Economic Council. Uh, Chris, of course, uh, has been instrumental uh, in the development of the subject matter. I know that uh, he has taught in one of our executive education courses up in Sacramento to our mayors and council members about performance and the, the subject matter that you're going to hear more about today. And of course, uh, second is one of our students, uh, our PhD candidate, Robert Jackman, uh, who ultimately, of course, uh, will own this in his dissertation, I presume. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, uh, Chris and, and Robert. hard to believe that I actually planned this because I, why would anyone want to give a talk just between that what's preventing you from eating lunch is my talk. But <laughs> that's where we are. So what we're going to be doing is we've been working for Los Angeles with Los Angeles for the last three years and I want to just give you some results on what, what, what it's been um, doing and what I wanted to start with is kind of set up what it's like, the, the incredibly difficult task of starting a performance management reform process. First of all, the whole idea of performance management has this duality of between this great deal of optimism. We have lots of case studies of cities being able to transform themselves. Um, Bob will, um, will speak to many of those, but the New York City story, the Baltimore story, are these stunning stories of great improvements in the ability of governments to provide services for their citizens through data-driven management. But at the same time, when you look at the entire literature and all the examples of efforts to, make, um, to do performance management, there's a lot of frustration out there. There's been a lot of efforts that really don't go anywhere. They, ne they never really get over the hump of producing any results. That uh, very frequently when people write about performance management, you find what's called a compliance result. That you file the reports, but you in fact don't change any of your behaviors within your organizations. Nothing is get, gets produced better. No one's really putting in the hard thought, the hard analysis to figure out how to improve services for citizens. And then the worst of all is when we have the scandals. The VA scandal, the, the Atlanta school scandals where performance, putting pressure on public organizations can then get them to falsify data to show that they're making, making those performance and can lead to some horrific results um, at times. So why are some of these reasons for the, the, this great variety of results in performance management? And the, 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 the really easy answer is that this is really complex. Herb Simon, the Nobel laureate, had a really great book called The Architecture of Complexity that he published back in the 1960s. And the point that he made is that when you, if you have a hard problem and it's decomposable, that you can break it off into small little problems and you can walk on, work on each of the little individual problems separately, that's much less complex. Where complexity comes into play when there's a lot of interreacting parts of the puzzle and they all have to work in an inter, interlocking way. And that's exactly what you have with performance management. There's lots of pieces to the performance management. You have to get your strategy right. You have to have uh, data that's useful. You have to have metrics that are actually well aligned with, uh, with your goals. You have to have leadership. You have to have management reform. And what you find, and certainly what I've been co convinced with, is that when you only get some of these pieces together, you end up with an inchoate reform that really doesn't accomplish very much. And the, the, when you see the real success cases are these examples when all of these or most of these um, success factors come into play. And just to give you an idea of how difficult this is, um, Sanders wrote, um, published a, a paper in um, uh, the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management a few years ago, and she just looked at how many cities are doing performance management well. Well, if you look at the number of cities that have more than 25,000 people in them, there's about 1,360 cities in state. What, what she found was that only 200 of those are publishing performance metrics on a consistent basis. Of those 200, only 27 of them 
are exercising the best practices for actually using that data to improve management processes. And then among those 27, she identified only seven cities that were really having differences in, in fully integrating all that data analysis into their management practices. So one half of 1% of the cities are really doing this well. Now these are really important success cases to look at, but these are very daunting odds to really operate on. So what are some of the pieces to try to um, kind of simplify what I was saying before? At a minimum, you have to have a combination of leadership, a combination of solid data and a combination of management routines to use that data in effective ways for identifying problems and identifying potential solutions. To get there, you have to have a really systematic and thorough and what I'm, I'm going to be emphasizing long implementation process to get your organization um, to that point. Going through that implementation cycle, most of these organizations, you see that you typically will start with strategic planning, then come up with objectives and measures. You come up with the data that you're going to use. You um, develop some analytic strategies, and then you give it a go. That's like the classic canonical way to set up a performance management system. Very rarely happens this way. People play around with some data. They have a strategic planning sense. Usually, they, they, they start up in, in different areas and do this. Typically, you have to go through all of these steps eventually to really become and have a successful implementation. But it is, um, it is very rare that people um, uh, go through this um, in a very particularly systematic way. So what about Los Angeles? The story that brought us all here is when Mayor Garcetti was elected for the first time um, five years ago. He's, he's, he ran on his back to basics agenda where he said that he wanted to have just four very clear goals. He wanted to make Los Angeles a well-run city, a prosperous city, a safe city, and a livable and sustainable city. I'm focusing in just on one of those four goals, obviously, here. And the context is that he did not come in to Los Angeles government at a very good time. LMU, which does these election surveys, they were finding that 50% of the citizens of Los Angeles were dissatisfied with the services that they were getting. Um, uh, even though that people can be typically dissatisfied, it was only 30% level of dissatisfaction in the other cities in Los Angeles County. So LA City was performing significantly worse. And at the same time, did he have lots of um, a, a big army to push these, um, push these reforms forward? No, they had lost 20% of their workforce in the previous five years during their financial crisis. So LA was operating with a bare bones staff at that point. So what he comes, uh, what, what Mayor Garcetti came in and to do, he said, look, we have CompStat. The LAPD had one of the most successful uses of data, um, data-based management in the entire world. Uh, why can't we take that model and spread it throughout the entire city? So he made that a goal and said that I want all 35 of our departments to come up with performance style reforms. They were left, it was a, mostly a decentralized form um, of, of, form of, ref, uh, of reform and trying to build the capacity to get these departments able to do it instead of dictating it from the center. So um, uh, at that point, I was working on performance management. I saw a very difficult implementation process ahead of the city. So we got together, funded by the Haynes Foundation. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, uh, that um, we did this. So we've done a couple of round of, uh, of, of surveys of the middle managers. We've done a, a lot of qualitative work to really see what, whether they have done the, um, uh, the steps in that implementation process that will enable them to get to that reform. So what are we what are we seeing so far? So what I'm going to show you is some a little bit of data on comparison our surveys. So the first question um, that you want is like, do you have some leadership? Is like, are your leaders setting goals? Are they saying how those goals work for um, or relate to the work that um, that people are doing? And so the general generally they are doing very well on this. They're a little bit weaker on actually able to translate what that strategy affects uh, any individual's parts of the goals. But a really good, good indication is that all of these indicators, indicators got stronger between our first survey in 2015 and our, and our last survey. So th j just think of it. This is an incredibly difficult um, metric to actually move the needle on. And so that the fact that the LA was able to move the needle um, really speaks that something is going right. And then there was the questions of um, 
whether you're using this data in an effective way. So there were some questions about whether that leaders are, are, are interested in using data. Do they actually use that data on a day-to-day -day basis? And do they cha change their decisions um, on that data? And again, one of the things that you see is that there's se um, between 2015 and 2016, there is a small but very uh, perceptual improvement in that. And most importantly, there's a, there's a number of departments that have made significant leaps forward in, um, uh, in, in, in the way their managers are seeing the, uh, the use of data. So a strong thing. So uh, some of the things that are preventing that data are, it's not politics that are getting in the way. The really the things that are getting in the way from these surveys is expertise, so they want more people who know under, understand how to format this data and analyze the data. And then the other problem is inadequate um, uh, uh, IT. So just having IT systems that generate data. So one of, the, one of the examples of that would be a 311 system that enables you to track the way that you fulfill citizen requests is a really useful tool for city management. The city's moving in that direction, but it's a, but it's a, but it's a major lift to get there. So, one of the things that we've seen, there hasn't been much change in, um, uh, in this particular metric, but the more that people are involved in performance management, the stronger their attitude, uh, 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 perspectives on it. So getting, you get, if, you, if you're here from a city, getting people involved in working on this is the best way to get people to feel like you can produce positive results. Now, just think of this. LA is an enormous organization. How many employees? 10,000 right now? What? 55? 55,000 people, it is, it is one of the largest battleships to try to turn around. So to try to turn around this culture is very difficult. So we did, we, in these surveys, we, we create a couple of um, <clears throat> indices on attitudes, on, on whether people really think that that performance management can work, their usage on the degree that they use data in their day-to-day -day life, and their proficiency, the, the degree to which they feel confidence in analyzing data to apply to um, uh, decisions. And when you look at that, you go, wow, we've, we just have not been able to move the needle very often. But the silver lining on the cloud is that the city's also been doing a swath of training on this. And then they, 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 there's been many more people who have been exposed to training. And when you compare the people who have gone through a training versus those who haven't gone through the training, there's a market increase in all of these metrics on their, uh, on their attitudes and, and, and perspectives on whether this is going to make a difference, on their ability to use it, and in the, the degree to which they feel that they're proficient to use it. So that all of this makes an enormous difference. Some of the things that we did um, for people who want to talk methods, they can come and, and talk to me um, at the end of the moment, but I did a kind of a sophisticated something called a, 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 the qualitative comparative uh, analysis. And what we were able to do is we were able to look at these different characteristics of departments, look over the 35 departments and see which one are the key features that led to success. And when you do this analysis, you can come up with three different, two different formulas for success. One of them is that if you have a large department, you have strong leadership and strong analytics, those departments were, were better able to improve their performance. Or another one is that he had a large department and, the, and, and Mayor Garcetti was specifically focused in this is a department that we wanted to pay close attention to, that also led to success. So there are, real, there are real formulas of success, uh, success there. And Robert now is going to talk a little bit more about the, um, some of the case studies that we did that will put some meat on the bones of these, uh, these formulas. Perfect. So Chris has asked me to talk about three specific departments where we've looked at case studies and how these case studies have sort of replicated these formulas for success. Uh, being large departments, having strong leadership, having strong analytics, and in certain cases, having a focus from the mayor's office. Um, and so these three departments are planning uh, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Sanitation. Um, first, I guess you can see it's fairly obvious if you work with the city or understand that these are large departments, but beyond just having a lot of employees or having a number of resources, they were able to dedicate a specific line of employees or a line of resources to be a part of these reforms. Uh, so for instance, planning has been running a geographic reorganization uh, of their department away from functions, silos of functions, to processing all their applications through geographic lines. Uh, and during this re, um, 
reimagining of their organization, they've been able to hire a number of new staff to staff each of these geographic offices. Uh, the Department of Transportation has had a long history uh, of using resources to hire outside vendors to collect analytics and data. So they've been working with Xerox, excuse me, with Xerox for over 30 years, and they've been able to integrate their contract with Xerox uh, into this performance management reform. Uh, and then we have sanitation. This is one of the centerpieces of these reforms, the clean stat system. Uh, so the city has made a large upfront investment in mapping over 22,000 miles of streets, mapping their cleanliness on a number of factors. And these mapping agents will go out once every three months to remap each and every city street in order to update how clean they are and whether the city's making progress. Uh, in terms of leadership, what we see is that at the GM and AGM level, specifically at the Department of Transportation, they've had strong leadership. And in sanitation and planning, uh, the deputy directors have really been driving these process. Uh, and what I would say about each of these leaders is that they've been students of the performance management reform. So they've been taking time to learn how to push or not push these reforms in certain ways and understand how their department is reacting. Uh, and some important parts of that leadership frequencies of meetings. Uh, so we see that these departments are either meeting monthly or bi-monthly compared to some other departments in the city who are maybe only meeting once every six months to talk about their metrics. So there's a push from the leaders to have regular meetings, regular updates. Uh, they're asking the right questions and challenging their staff in these meetings to use their performance data proactively instead of just counting. Uh, and specifically, for instance, planning has decided that they want to run local trainings for each of their new geographic offices related to this initiative. Um, a little bit about the strong analytics. So. For instance, the Department of Transportation, their general manager has pushed to move their analytics from looking at their outputs to looking at their outcomes. So instead of the number of projects completed, they want to look at how traffic flow has improved or how citizen safety has improved. Uh, and as I already talked about, sanitation has been using this GIS system analytically to proactively plan how they're going to clean city areas. Uh, finally, mayoral focus, and I just want to talk specifically about clean streets. Uh, when it comes to mayoral focus. So this has been a big initiative from the mayor's office that was put forth in mid-2015. Uh, and because of the attention that the mayor's office has focused on clean streets, it's received the resources and the leadership and some of these other things that we've talked about. Uh, and what, so what does this lead to for each of these departments? What we talk about in the performance management process is that these departments want to move from implementation and simple counting to active problem solving, future planning, and allocating their resources using this data. Uh, and a few examples of that, the planning department, for instance, now has a triage team that they use. Uh, so they look at which geographic departments have backlogs uh, in cases, and they move this triage team to those departments to make sure that they're staying on top of those cases and metrics. Uh, the Department of Transportation has been proactively been using their metrics uh, to move traffic officers around, to assess where traffic patterns are worse, and have more officers in these areas to control traffic. Uh, and for instance, the Department of Sanitation now has a 98% pickup rate uh, in terms of bulky items within a 24-hour period, and they've identified this as a priority that they're proactively working to keep. Uh, so we can see that each of these departments, through the leadership, uh, through their large size, analytics, and in some cases, mayoral focus, have been moving to these active problem solving, these future planning and resource allocating departments within the city. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris, and he'll share some final lessons uh, about our project. Thanks. Thank you. So I'll just contribute um, earlier because the panel is really going to be talking about uh, um, overcoming challenges for reform. So let me just put in my two cents at this point. And the first point I think from the lesson I'm taking away from, uh, uh, from LA is that resources really matter. And this is also from our work at, uh, at looking at performance management at the state level in, in Sacramento. 
Um, having a, um, a bench of leaders and champions for these causes is incredibly important. At this, um, so that uh, uh, having a performance management unit in the mayor's office really is important. This performance management unit, when you compare it to other, other cities, has actually had a, it's a very small staff compared to New York or compared to, uh, uh, to what Baltimore was, uh, w was using. So it's, um, uh, so they've been doing, they, they've been doing a great job. Uh, more more re uh, resources are really good. The other thing is that when you really look at the, 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 the big changes, the big changes come when you get much better data that you can get uh, you can get in real time that's really very detailed. So the city has invested an enormous amount in getting this very detailed GIS data on, um, on garbage in the streets, and then you can make some really significant, uh, uh, significant improvements um, in that area. Um, along those lines, the, the idea because resources matter, it becomes increasingly important to, be, to have a very sharp focus. Trying to do everything really dissipates your ability to do, to do anything. So the places that we've seen the advantages are the larger departments in Los Angeles because they were the places that they could have a few people who could really focus in on this. There's a number of very small departments on this that were asked to do performance management, but when you have a department with only about 20 people in it, no single person can really focus in on this new management task with, uh, uh, with sufficient vi uh, vigor. Um, at the same time, political leadership is really important, as, uh, as Robert described in the, uh, in the clean stat um, example, but the mayor only has limited time. So to the extent that you can do things, having, um, focusing in narrowly on a, number, on a small number of initiatives um, uh, uh, ma uh, makes sense. And then the other thing is that usually this performance manager, because you have to come up with metrics that you can act on, the more concrete your mission, the better it is. So having, whether there's garbage on the street is very, very concrete, while neighborhood empowerment, where, where you have more or less democratic empowerment in the city of LA is, very, is much more difficult to, uh, to encapsulate in a metric. Training, I think a really important result that we got is, uh, here is some um, uh, the real value of training. And I would say it's not only training on the job, but um, I'm, whenever I'm working in this performance management area, I always feel like this is the best advertisement for hiring master's degree students in public policy and public administration, because they, they can do great, great things for you. And the, and the last thing is that it's really, it's really important to understand this, is, this doesn't get done in two years. These guys have been at it for four years. They're making real progress on this. Um, this is really important things to do, but this is, this is more a five, 10 year process. And if you can't commit yourself to a, a focus of that long, the, the potential benefits are severely diminished. And with that, um, if you have any questions, then it'll be up to you that you're, you're, you're keeping yourselves from your own lunch. Yes. Uh -huh. How aligned is the training with the cultural change implementation? Because as you know, oftentimes, People get trained, they go back to work, and things are the way they used to be, they forget about the training they went through. So I would be appreciative if you would elaborate on that. Well. Ashley, can I, can I have you speak to that? So Ashley is running this training, so uh, in the city of, La, of Los Angeles, so she can really. Yeah, the training is based off of continuous improvement efforts, so we call it Perform LA. And uh, the basis of it is the methodology. So understanding uh, your processes and the services that you deliver, and identifying and removing waste from those processes. And um, we've seen a lot of success from, from the training. It's aligned with the department's services that they, that they actually deliver. But something that we are continuously tinkering with is uh, kind of seeing how we can make it the most effective training. So when we have initially started it, we are just trying to get it out there and kind of deploy it to all employees, uh, random deploy employees across departments. And since then, we've decided that that's not necessarily the most effective way to, to manage the training. And instead, are moving to a uh, process where we're actually training all the people within a section and, and the division within a department. Uh, so that everybody has the same definitions, terminology, has the same tools, things like that. So kind of, we're working towards that. And do you uh, do anything in terms of incentivization and engagement? 
we're actually in the process of really understanding our uh, incentive structure. So we've, we've used the continuous improvement tools in the city uh, recently in our own unit and uh, did a survey with the employees that have taken the training uh, to understand what kind of drives them. So is it supervisor approval and support or is it competitions and prizes, things like that. Uh, and we're in the process of creating a set of incentives that we're going to now test on the employees to see what the effects are from, from that data. Uh, aside from that, we've been bringing people together uh, to do perform LA meetups. So people who have gone through the training, talking to each other about innovations and that they're working on or different barriers and successes that they have uh, so that they can kind of do a knowledge transfer that way. Okay. I'll just add to that that in, in some ways the, 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 the cultural link is the leadership that sets the expectations. So when you have strong expectations in your organization that you are going to be able to come up with a data-based rationale for your allocation of resources, the, your allocation of time in accomplishing certain tasks, that, that, changes, that changes the culture. Then the training reinforces that by giving people the tools and the capacity and the confidence to be able to work within that environment. And that's what I think is, is the longer time. So, so just to give those of you who don't know from when I'm here for the city of Santa Monica, but I was deputy mayor starting two weeks into the Garcetti administration in charge of this effort. And um, two things I think um, important in this background. One, how much Eric Garcetti was a personal champion of this, right? Mayors, by the nature of things, give credit for a lot of things they don't deserve um, because they're the mayor. Um, and uh, sometimes, unfortunately, they don't give credit for things they do deserve. Um, but in Eric's case, he lived in a different world from most people in LA government, even though he'd been in LA government for 12 years, because of his experience in the Naval Reserve and his network, personal network of college buddies and friends who were in the private sector. And so they live in the Navy and in the private sector. They live and breathe performance management. And so Eric absorbed that mindset and wondered why with his transition team that was not a thing in Los Angeles given the opportunity. So Eric was a thoughtful and committed um, proponent of it. He was alone in that. The other people around him who had grown up in city government, who were loyal to him, who were incredibly wonderful civil servants and political um, experts, God bless them. I love them personally and respect the heroic effort, but they, it, this was completely um, utopian to them. It's like, nice idea. Uh, we'll indulge the mayor in, in this idea, but A, this will take forever in a day, and we only have four years to get reelected. And B, it probably is never going to happen. And so it was really crucial that the mayor personally committed to it. Everyone around him knew that he was committed to it. And so um, he was the one who really pushed it, it forward. And the value proposition to him was improving services to citizens. That's what he did in 12 years on the city council, is he saw how if you just work, you can actually improve. And that was the case that he made to the people of Los Angeles, is what happened in Hollywood, what happened in Atwater Village, and what happened in Silver Lake, you can argue about gentrification and other you know, politically hot topics, but there's no question that life was better after 12 years of the Garcetti council ship in those three neighborhoods because of the active involvement of Eric's approach to, to improving basic services. That's the case he made, and then he wanted to make that case for the four million people of Los Angeles. And, and Dan, I would, I would yeah. give, give you an opportunity to answer the same question. Go ahead and be here. Dan Harris, Director of our Innovation Performance Management Unit in the office. Um, worked with Rick uh, at the beginning of this, so I've been, been here since the start of a lot of this. Um, 
Uh, the only thing I want to just add on, when the mayor, when the mayor came in, uh, his big pitch to the people of LA was to get back to basics. And a lot of that meant that you should be able to trust your government to do the core services that you expect. And it, I believe that he saw, you know, there's a time when people are expecting, uh, you know, when you order something on Amazon, it's going to tell you when it's going to you know, arrive. That the types of way that people are interacting with private companies are very much driven by data and by immediate response and, and continuous customer service. You know, we have a thing we like to say about, you know, we want, we want service to be clear, quick, quick, clear, and concise. Um, it's, uh, it's really important to the mayor that people feel like their government is just another example of the world working better, being easier, being actually more uh, focused and aware of their needs without them having to necessarily uh, go down to City Hall and present at a, you know, a huge public comment. And so I think that really drove him. He sees himself as being you know, one of those, the, the, the first wave of mayors that are really focused on getting that same expectation among, uh, among the, the residents that they can think of their government the same way they think of their private sector. So if I were Sheila Kuehl or Herb Weston or um, Mark Ridley Thomas, and I would say, what lesson is there? The big number, the big metric is 80. 80% of the voters re-elected Eric Garcetti after four years of this. <laughs> so time to get on board, right? They, they, might, they might say, oh, he's a pretty face. Oh, he's, you know, he's a very cautious guy. Oh, he's very articulate. He made services demonstrably better in four years, something that most people had given up on in Los Angeles. And he got re-elected with 80% of the vote. I think that's a very powerful uh, value case for a politician to, to emulate. And so, oh, what's it? <laughs> I was just going to add um, to the comments that uh, Rick and Dan made. If the value proposition, if you only look at this as just a tool uh, to improve services or do those sort of things, that's only going to take you so far. So I think, um, as Rick said, that he, Eric Garcetti was trying to drive this into the culture of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and that's a big dividing point that we saw in some of the successful departments versus departments that might have been struggling to some degree with these reforms is that if you only consider this as just a tool to do your job, uh, you, this will only take you so far in reaching that value proposition. But if you integrate it into the organizational culture, uh, that's when you can make those leaps and really improve services. Um, I guess we've been told we have time for one more question because we've, we've started to get the panel involved already and I know these are, I know you have a number of questions in the panel. We also don't want to keep you from your lunch. So maybe one more question and okay. then we'll move to lunch. Terry. Um, I'm uh, interested in hearing a little bit more about clean stat. You said that there's this iterative mapping of all the streets in LA. Now, how do you score those streets on cleanliness? So they're very long. Is it block by block? Or? They, they have teams of people um, g drive down every single street in Los and alleyway of Los Angeles with iPads, I imagine, and they're, sco they're scoring the streets. Every single time they see an illegal dump, it goes on to this. And then it's all mapped on, on GIS, and then they're able to have a management meeting that looks at, looks at all of these. The most incredible, one of the most interesting things that I saw is the one meeting that I saw is that um, they had a map of Venice. And um, uh, they, were, they were looking at this, and there were, there were a number of really bad streets that had illegal dumps and, uh, um, and, and weeds and lots of problems. And they were like, well, where should we target our resources? And they all go, why don't we target our resources right here? That, this is where Mike Bonin lives. <laughs> <laughs> and who's a, who's a city council member from, uh, fr from that area. And the decision was, no, actually the problem is significantly worse in this set of blocks. We're gonna, we will we'll focus in over here instead. And that, was, um, the, 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 that is the best way to have data management, uh, data-based management working. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all again for being here. My name is Frank Sarunian. I'm a professor of the practice of governance at the Seoul Price School of Public Policy. And on my spare time, I'm the mayor of Rolling Hills Estates. 
Um, I have been in local governance now for almost 20 years, served on planning commission as well as, of course, uh, elected to my city council uh, in first time 2003 um, and have served as mayor three times as we rotate our mayorship, as you might know, some of our cities uh, that uh, use that model. Uh, this is my third time as mayor, as I currently serve as mayor. Uh, so this topic is, um, as I may have mentioned a, a while ago, is near and dear to not only to our school's heart, uh, as it is extremely important in governance, but it is to mine. Uh, so I thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Hilda, Chris, Juliet, uh, for inviting me to uh, be on this panel and, and moderate this panel of distinguished scholars as well as practitioners. So it's our pleasure to have them all here. Um, I will introduce each one of them. Uh, they, they all are so distinguished that if I were to introduce them, we will spend the whole time and then perhaps the whole afternoon. So I won't do that. I'll introduce them just very by maybe one sentence or two, just to give you a bit of context in case uh, you're wondering. And then uh, I will ask each one of them uh, right off the bat to react to what we saw uh, uh, in the presentation of Chris uh, and Robert. And then we'll engage into a conversation. I hope this to be a real conversation um, so that we can all engage and, and that would be the purpose of, of all of this this afternoon. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, my friends and colleagues um, on this uh, panel. To my right uh, is Scott Ochoa, a good friend. Uh, for many, many years, as well as uh, one of our adjunct faculty members uh, who teaches uh, at the Price School um, and uh, always uh, is ready to come to my classes to speak. And, and I always invite Scott uh, to come to speak to my students. And this year, Scott was our uh, city manager in residence as uh, we uh, uh, had him uh, here for a week. Scott is a graduate of Claremont McKenna College and, of course, one of our own, USC Price alumnus uh, with his MPA. Uh, I've known Scott for many, many years when he was actually city manager in Monrovia with some of my great friends on the, that city council and uh, worked his way to uh, city of Glendale, recently also a city where a number of council members are dear friends of mine. Um, and of course uh, was named 2014 Man of the Year by Glendale Latino Association. We can't forget that. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Scott, for being here. Uh, immediately to his right is our colleague, uh, a senior lecturer from Harvard Kennedy School, Dr. Bob Ben. Uh, Dr. Ben is, of course, considered a leading scholar on the subject matter in leadership and performance in public organizations. He is the faculty chair of the Kennedy School's uh, executive program, Driving Government Performance leadership strategies that produce results. Uh, he has written, of course, he's extremely well published and he has written numerous books. Uh, and uh, he received his PhD in decision and control from Harvard, is a fellow at the National Academy of Public Administration. Welcome, Bob. Uh, to his right, the Honorable Rick Cole, uh, a former council member and a mayor from the city of Pasadena and currently, of course, serving as a city manager in Santa Monica uh, via uh, city of Los Angeles, as he mentioned earlier, deputy mayor uh, in the city of Los Angeles. Um, he also served as city manager for Azusa and Ventura for over 15 years, uh, and of course, uh, won numerous awards, including the ASPA and Municipal Management Association of Southern California, Rick is known to a lot of us in, in the governance world as uh, a tremendous practitioner. Welcome, Rick. To his right, we have Dan Caracelli, uh, Director of Innovation and Performance Management, City of Los Angeles Mayor's Office. Uh, Dan is a graduate of the Brown University and received his Master of Urban Planning from UCLA. Uh, prior to his current position, uh, yeah, I almost said the other school, but I didn't. Uh, I wanted to be gracious. Uh, 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 
Prior to his current, current position, uh, he was a Bonnet Fellow in Mayor's Office of Economic and Business Policy. He, of course, as he mentioned earlier, oversees the subject matter performance management initiatives in the city of LA. Of course, last but not least, um, one of my professorial mentors, as Juliette Mousseau, Dr. Mousseau hired me actually eight years ago uh, to Sol Price School uh, as an adjunct faculty member, and look what you did. <laughs> Can't get rid of me. Uh, she's, of course, uh, thank you. She's, of course, our Houston Florida prof professor of state government and at the USC Price School. And of course, he is a prolific writer and amazingly published uh, scholar in this field. And of course, I still use in my classes uh, our colleague Terry Cooper and, and uh, uh, Juliet's work with respect to uh, neighborhood councils and the topic of engagement a uh, number of years ago. Believe it or not, I talked about neighborhood council, Terry and Juliet, in Shenzhen, China. So uh, you, you were well represented there. Uh, your work, at least, was represented there. Um, she uh, is the co-PI, of course, of uh, our formative evaluation of performance for the city of LA. Uh, and uh, her PhD is in public policy from UC Berkeley. So welcome to all of you. So perhaps we can start now from that side and uh, a short reaction to what we saw present, our, our colleagues present this, uh, this morning, and then perhaps we can engage into a dialogue uh, thereafter. Juliet, if I could start yes. with you. Thank you. Now, can everyone hear me? So I'm not only a faculty member, which means that you're used to speaking loudly. I have two teenagers, so I spoke very loudly when I pointed out many times yesterday that it was Mother's Day and they shouldn't do what they're doing. Um, they call that playing the Mother's Day card. Um, so actually, unfortunately, you, you may recall that when you got the invitation, Pat Martell was going to be on the panel. She's a very distinguished city um, I'm sorry, city manager who has been um, the president of ICMA. And unfortunately, she had to go to Washington, D.C., so I am stepping in. Um, I am not Pat Martell, but I will point out that ICMA has a lot of wonderful resources and has been leading initiatives around performance for many years, which is, I suspect, one of the things she probably would have said. I don't know what else she would have said, but I suspect that was she had mentioned it to me. So. I'm putting it out there. And, and it's interesting because being involved with this project followed on work that actually that Chris and I were doing in Sacramento looking at performance at the state level. And so I just wanted to say a few words about what I see as being some commonalities and differences between what's going on in LA there, um, LA and in Sacramento. Um, by the way, some of you may not know, but Chris and I are also married. So I may or may not have also said to him yesterday, hey, it's Mother's Day, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, <laughs> my family is irritated by my propensity to do that on Mother's Day. Um, so, <laughs> so what's interesting is um, to contrast the sort of challenges to performance at the local level compared to at the state level. And what I see happening in LA that's quite interesting is real mayoral leadership and fortunately a mayor that was reelected so we'll be able to carry this forward for eight years. And then very good analysts because as we know there are many um, people from both USC and UCLA with master's students who work at, in Los Angeles. And so they have a lot of analytic capacity and some of the challenges seem to be more about just the in, inevitable difficulty of figuring out how to use metrics in departments where metrics may be difficult to apply, which is just difficult inherently. And then the IT challenges, which can be daunting, particularly for a local government. What we've seen in Sacramento, which is quite different, is that there's a distance between proponents at the top. So you can have, for example, we had um, Pete Wilson who came in for a while, or and Duke, uh, uh, sorry, um, Schwarzenegger, who were both very focused on trying to improve performance. And it's very difficult to get gubernatorial 
con concerns convey down through secretaries into the departments. And so what you've seen now in Sacramento mm -hmm. is that there are a number of departments where there are, are attempts to try to work forward with performance. It's really being driven less from the top but from the middle, interestingly. And so there's the group called the um, California Performance Management Council that's been meeting there for a number of years, which is why we sort of, both Chris and I got interested in this early on. And they think of it, they sometimes talk about it as being therapy for middle managers who want to do this and feel that they neither have a lot of support and resources from the top, and then they have staff who are trying to do this who do not have the analytic capacity that you often see in a big city with major universities with professional degree programs. And so one of the big challenges at the state level in California, and I suspect also at many other states, is that civil service requirements are so dominated by um, state unions that having a master's degree doesn't actually help you get a job there at the state level. And there are some attitudes among managers who don't have master's degrees and have essentially been promoted through the ranks that are actually anti-master's degree. And so I think that the, the big strengths that Los Angeles has is, in fact, um, its ability to tap talent in the region in the, in, in, the, in the form of analysts who can kind of keep this moving forward. So I think I'll leave it at that and turn to Dan. I'm assuming we're just going down the row. All right, well, first of all, I uh, definitely want to express our deep gratitude to USC, to the Haynes Foundation uh, for making this, this possible. Um, this has been an incredible resource for us to have as we've started this out. You know, uh, thank you, Chris, Hilda, Robert, Juliet. Um, it's been, uh, it's felt, it's felt a little bit less like we're uh, out in the woods by ourselves on this, so I, th I thank you for, for all, of, all of your support and help on that. Um, one thing that, because we've been the subject of this and we've been working with the, the team, um, we, we knew a few of the findings before, uh, before the presentation, so <laughs> responding uh, to, to things we've, we've known for a bit, um, the, the, the thing that really comes up to me always throughout this is the need for prioritization and for focusing on on outcomes and really seeing the forest uh, through the trees. I think when we first started, uh, and in most departments, uh, there, there was a tendency that people already knew what this was, or thought they knew what this was, right? There was already an idea that performance stat data, oh, I, I know what that is, or somebody's tried that, or I've seen that, or, or we could never do that. We don't have the technology of, of so-and-so department, or of Zappos, or whoever, to, to deliver that kind of customer service and or what we do is really hard to yeah there you go what we do is really hard to measure exactly that's the that's the common refrain um and so everybody seems to have an idea about that and so when they started they started with their own preconceptions of what it was that they're supposed to be doing and it's supposed to be hard and it's supposed to take a lot of resources and it's supposed to be difficult and i'm supposed to not be able to do it because i don't not fully resourced and adequate so it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy um when, when we really worked through this, and my, my big aha moment was actually on a, a beach in, uh, in Cancun reading Bob Bain's book um, on uh, uh, performance staff potential. It was great, it's great beach reading. Um, uh, you know, uh, coconut and, uh, and, uh, and Bob Bain, uh, it's a great, a great way to spend your, uh, spend your vacation. Um, but, you know, really, really the focus on leadership, and, and it came up uh, again and again in the presentation just how important it is that that people are hearing what it is that matters. Um, you know, it really, it, it really helps. Obviously, we saw that departments that are bigger, that have more resources, but also especially departments that have a clear message or clear mission um, are able to do a lot better on this. Um, but that's not something that is inherent. I think, you know, we've seen a big change in our planning department somewhere where the department really never saw themselves as being uh, a service delivery organization. They were Planners, they are, I'm, I'm a planner, so I can make fun of planners. You know, they're, they're, we're, we're artisans, we're crafting the, 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 the public space. And so our job is not just to move something from here to there. Why should we use numbers to measure this? This is all about humans' real experience of a place. And, and you know, as they understood that this could actually help them in that, um, they've, they've been able to move forward. And as they've understood that 
people understand that, that, that using numbers, you're not going to be able to capture everything, and that let's try to measure the things that do matter. And really what's most important is that we're trying to improve things, and, and that really what's important is that we all are on the same uh, align towards a similar vision. When you can step back and really think about what it is that you're trying to do, and that's why it's really important, those three things that, that Chris mentioned, you know, the leadership, the data, and the management innovation, when, when we, by focusing on all those steps and not just the data, is I think where we've been the most successful. And I think um, one thing I didn't get to say earlier when we were talking about uh, you know, why the mayor saw the value proposition in this uh, is he, he wanted to move to bigger things than just cleaning up trash. Um, obviously, we have much bigger challenges in the city of LA. Homelessness is one of our key challenges. He knew that we couldn't get to those until we were very, that the, the, the public was confident that we could actually do our jobs. And I think once you get people to understand that that you can build trust through this to get to those bigger things. Everybody wants to jump and, and, and to start doing bigger things and there's always bigger challenges to tackle. There's always a reason why you know, we shouldn't be focusing on this. Here's the big problem. If you can build that trust and get those imp incremental uh, improvements, then you can get to that stuff and have the, and have the buy in to really achieve that. Um, thoughtful comments uh, from both of um, both Juliet and Dan. And I, I want to both build on them and offer three observations from what we just heard. Um, I, too, am struck by the ingredients of success, um, particularly the, um, the, the first model that you found successful. The, the, am I not speaking loud enough? OK, I'll, I'll talk louder. So the, the three that were found to be in that first model of, of a successful case study were the larger departments that had the capacity. Uh, the departments that had real departmental buy-in and leadership to, to, to problem solve, not just check the box, uh, and who um, had a more concrete focus, that, that in fact what they were doing was easier to measure, at least arguably. Um, that, that corresponds to my sense that, that this has to be a coalition of the willing, um, that trying to, to impose this across all departments equally at the same pace with the same expectations is, um, is a poorly thought out strategy. That one ought to go to the, to the places where there is more, a greater likelihood of success, demonstrate that success, and then have it spread. The, the second um, is we're always looking for surefire formulas, right? That's, that's now a, a word that I learned, a listicle, right? This is a lazy way of writing an article in which you say the 10 best cities or the 15 best hamburgers in LA or five ways in which you can improve your life today or 16 ways to have uh, you know, better abs. Um, <laughs> that, 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 this, that, that we're always looking for that, you know, we just paint by the numbers. And, and if we just did one, two, three, four, five, boom, uh, you know, great city, um, and better abs. And, 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 and the reality is so much more complex. And so the focus in, in uh, Chris and, and Robert's um, discussion about culture is, I think, critical. The most important cultural schism, I think, in the public service is between the vast majority of people who think we're in the service delivery business, who think that we are here to because we, somebody has to do the fire department, somebody has to do the police department, somebody has to do the libraries, somebody has to do the parks, that would be us. And though the, the, the growing minority of folks who are pointing toward a future in which we focus not on the services we deliver, but the outcomes we achieve, that the community is safer, the community is more prosperous, uh, the community is more of a community, uh, that, that we uh, reach the people who uh, are the most vulnerable in our society. Those are outcomes. Uh, environmental sustainability is an outcome. These are not things we do. These are outcomes we try to achieve. And I think that if your culture is still built around we're, we're in the service business, you're in the same place as Blockbuster was five years ago, 
you're in the same place that the newspaper industry was 10 years ago, you're in the same place that the auto industry was in 20 years ago, you're still thinking that you're, all, you're in the business of being in the business you're in instead of in the business of delivering value uh, to the community or, your, or, or the citizens. And, and the last um, observation is, and um, I'm going to differ a little bit with Juliet, I am not at all impressed by master's degrees. <laughs> But I am very, very impressed with the people that come out of the Price School and the Luskin School uh, in, in Southern California. Um, now, there are people who come out of Loyola and Pepperdine and Northridge uh, and some of the other programs. But um, the folks coming out of Price and Luskin um, are really quite remarkable. Uh, and, and I don't know what they're doing inside the walls there, but we hired a ton of Bruins at, um, at at uh, the mayor's office and a ton of Trojans. Um, and, and there was a, a real value, uh, not so much I think in the piece of paper that says I have a master's, but in um, the, the uh, I think both schools have a practitioner <coughs> bent. They have, a, they have a sense that it's important to be um, anchored in what's actually happening out there. And that is not a dumbing down of the curriculum. That is a focusing of the curriculum on, what, on how it can change the world. And th that there's a very different thing. And I think we need many more bright, thoughtful, piercing intellects um, applied to the challenges of public service. And whether they have a degree or not is, is um, I think, just a convenience, right? To, you know, say, OK. Uh, that, that's a person worth looking at. But the kind of people who um, we're seeing come out of these schools and other places, that's what we need in the public sector. We need to be thinking again. Um, you know, when I, my first job as a city manager was in Azusa, which, which Scott knows well. And in fact, I tried to hire Scott to come um, work for me in Azusa because this is his hometown. And we both care deeply. This is a working class Latino community that's gotten the crap kicked out of it by, um, by economics, uh, by injustice and racism in our society, and frankly, by poor public management over the decades, um, as well as political uh, mismanagement. Uh, and um, in, in coming into to that city, uh, my, my predecessor had put five tax measures on one ballot. They were in such desperate condition that they needed to pass five tax measures. Of course, four of them went down to flaming defeat. And the other one, which should have gotten 99% of the vote, right, which was to tax the rock companies that were digging giant holes in the town to tax them, um, that got 50.1%, right? You know, it's like, they, we, we trust the government enough to tax big polluters, right? Just barely, but, but just enough. So this was sort of the, the desperate shape that, that, that Azusa was in. Um, and so in my first year there, uh, I called upon what is probably an apocryphal quote, uh, but which is nonetheless a powerful one of the British statesman at the depths of World War II, who said, we are out of money. We are going to have to think. <laughs> and that is where I think the public sector is today. Um, because of pensions, because of a systematic failure to invest in our infrastructure, because of um, out of control uh, costs of doing business, we are mostly out of money. Now, that's not true in Santa Monica, but I can tell you to a moral certainty, it is true in Los Angeles. We are out of money, we are going to have to think, so we need bright people in government to do that. Hi, uh, I'm Bob Bain. Um, I'm going to pick up on the leadership theme with just a little different uh, emphasis. Um, when you had your early slide with the crossword puzzles, my first reaction was, why wasn't leadership in the middle? Um, uh, I, w I forget what was in the middle. Uh, to, oh, oh, we'll get to that in just a second. OK. Um, uh, what, but leadership really means the question of how you spend your time. 
Um, people watch their superiors in any organization and want to know what they care about. They watch how they spend their time. Don't read the memos. Don't listen to the speaches. If they're spending their time in something that's important, if they aren't, it isn't important. Um, second thing is the importance of small wins. There's a famous article that I assume all your graduate students read, Strategy of Small Wins. Um, most organizations think they can't do anything, and so you need to convince them that they can, and one way is to create a small win that everybody said you couldn't do, and then once you do it, they say, well, you know, actually, maybe we could accomplish something, and then you give them the next win, then the next win, and the next win all along. Um, but you have to be sustained, focused on that particular win at any particular time. And if you're spending your time on it, then people will do so too. Um, second thing is, I, I'm a guy who earned his PhD in applied math. I cannot read my dissertation anymore. Um, but I have one characteristic that I'm struck that most of our graduate students don't have. And that is not that I can do division, but that I actually do it. I'm in the habit of doing it. I'm in the habit of saying, is that number large or small? Uh, example, I'm driving through the state of Maine. You know, it's on the East Coast. Um, it's actually a very big state, um, it's very long, and I'm driving down the interstate. And here's a sign that says, beware of moose. Um, 767 car moose accidents last year. And I keep driving. And then I drive, divide by 365. And I say, that's two a day. That's a large number of car moose accidents on average. And just so you know, the moose live in the north and the people live in the south. So getting them together um, would be a significant challenge if you were responsible for producing two car moose accidents <laughs> every day. Okay? Um, 767 didn't mean anything. Two a day means something. And so understanding the nature of a problem usually requires you to do a little bit arithmetic. It's not that you can't do it. It's our people in the habit of using that simple um, analytical tool. Um, the um, last thing I want to emphasize, which will make all the planners in the room mad at me, is just start. Um, don't engage in the strategic planning effort, which means we have to get all the ducks perfectly lined up before we do anything. Um, Bill Bratton has, I've heard him say this on numerous occasions, look, you, you can do it. You don't need to get all the things lined up. When um, Bratton Wolf would say, what is a precinct lieutenant commander in uh, Boston, he just used pins on a map. And that simple analytic tool was extremely helpful in policing. Unfortunately, it's not helpful in everything, though I suspect um, if you're thinking about how you're going to, which streets need their attention, um, as opposed to which street corners need, which streets need their um, uh, sanitation attention is no different than which street, which street corners need your policing attention. So um, get those small wins convince the organization that they can do something, and then say, okay, what should we do next? Scott. A lot of uh, great, insightful comments. I, I would tell you the uh, presentation, congratulations, it resonated as a practitioner. It was, it was old home week. Everything that you're saying is everything that we are seeing. And so in, in that familiarity, uh, there was some comfort, but there's also uh, some degree of frustration. I, I would tell you that the things that, uh, that what makes you frustrated is that we know what what the the uh, what we should be doing, what the ingredients of progress are, yet we don't do. And I would tell you that uh, the notion of of culture is so uh, very powerful in in the context of an organization of a bureaucracy and trying to to change it. And when I got to to Glendale in January of 2012, uh, there was a culture of fear. Nobody wanted to measure anything because it's ultimately going to get used against you. And then if you do measure it, I'm going to, as the, the example was used, I'm going to maybe distort it just a little bit so it puts the best look on it. 
Well, what happens when you're actually trying to compare across uh, multiple time frames? It's garbage in, garbage out, which gets to the other element of the culture in terms of cynicism. I mean, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about uh, you know, reinventing government, and that one passed too, like a, like a, you know, a, a mustard burp. It was you know, kind of momentarily tangy, but ultimately forgettable. You know, the, you know folks, they, they would you know, we'd say, okay, well, we, we've been through Oh, this is the new guy? The new guy is going to pass before too long, and, and with him or her will be... The, uh, this notion of performance management, performance measurement. So this notion of, of culture and combating that cynicism that this is just a fad and that, you know, as we call it in Glendale, you know, as, a, as a frustrated old wannabe football player from my days at Azusa High, run to the contact. You know, it, and, and the notion of beginning somewhere. It's gonna, you're gonna get hit. It's gonna hurt, but if you run to the contact and get there first just with the most, you're probably gonna be better off than if you wait and absorb that blow. And so that notion of saying that, uh, you know, don't be afraid of your data. You are what the data says you are. And you have my commitment to you, as long as I'm here, that uh, we will use it in productive ways. Uh, the, the department that had the best data, the, the easiest, most readily available things to count was the police department. But uh, damn it, if they weren't the ones that did not want to show it. And so we got to a point where it, it's, it is a coalition of the willing. If you can convince a couple and you get some of those, those little, the small wins, I'll pick off those departments that want to play, those departments that are, are eager to, to challenge themselves that are populated by conservative people, and then we can start to, to get this wheel turning just a little bit. All that is good on the culture side, but it gets also, it migrates then to this notion of, of diligence and, and patience. Because, as Dr. Musa had indicated, there, there are people scattered throughout your organization that are so fully vested in the status quo that they do not want to change. And if you start to say, we're going to start comparing ratios, we're not just going to look at you know, how many potholes we fix, but the cost it takes, the time it takes us to, to fill them, we'll cross-reference different data sets and get cost per something um, and, and, and start to, to hopefully create more valuable information. Well, somebody doesn't know how to do that math. There are folks that have been out there in that organization, just time and grade. I made it to a list. I'm on the list. My turn rose up to the top. I just got promoted. I don't know how to do, I don't know how to speak the language that any of you folks are speaking, but I got this property right in a job. And now you got to find workarounds for those people that don't get it either uh, you know, uh, for their own reasons, malicious, or they just don't have that, that capacity. So uh, if, if you're willing to just keep on turning the wheel and just keep on uh, moving forward, ultimately you will weed some of those people out. Ultimately you'll, get, uh, you'll make believers out of those people that formerly were not believers. And if we do it often enough and diligently enough to put real resources into it, then I think, yeah, those small wins start to multiply and you get to, to Collins's flywheel that you're beginning to turn. You do that and you generate the momentum that's self-perpetuating then a lot of the big problems that we have as cities don't look nearly as big. Thank you, Scott. Thank you all for uh, your comments. And uh, perhaps now we can uh, uh, dive a little bit more into the conversation. And uh, what I'd like to do perhaps is to divide the conversation into two. One, at the beginning, perhaps we can focus on the research in the city of LA. And there are other people in the room, I'm sure, that are from different cities, and including me, and uh, who are very interested in the transfer of this innovation to potentially to other cities. The value of this research mm -hmm. ultimately will be not only for LA, but hopefully the 88 cities that are in LA County, and then beyond, of course, 482 cities in the state of California. So to be the transformational school that we are, I hope that we engage in that discussion just as well. But first on the LA topic. I, not long ago, I was on an uh, um, aircraft carrier as part of the Navy's Leader at Sea program. And I was talking to the, uh, there's a lot that you learn from CEOs of aircraft carriers, uh, whether it's leadership or other topics. <laughs> and he very astutely said, I said, wow, this is impressive how this ship is turning. He said, yes, I've done nothing impressive. And he said, without the few thousand people that make this people <laughs> turn, I'd be nothing here sitting with you. So that reminded me how important it is because we've been talking about Eric in particular. He's a dear friend of mine. I've known Eric since he graduated from Columbia because I'm very good friends with his father. Um, and he's done a great job in leadership, but he can't do it alone. Hmm. And in this next segment, perhaps, we can have uh, your remarks towards three things that I've heard from you, which is leadership, small wins and culture in particular. 
what can the city of LA do in order to be able to be helpful to Eric to steer the ship of 55,000 people um, so that this topic becomes more successful and becomes something that focuses on the value that we previously discussed because I always tell my students that I'm elected to deliver a quality of life. That's what I'm elected to do. And for the most part, if I can bring that value into the quality, then perhaps I'd be able to convince my constituents to be able to focus on data-driven topics. And data is very important to cities, as we know, and cities are in the business of data. We have a lot of data. We know how many trash bins you have in your house. I know how many variances you have in your house. I know how many non-conforming uses you have in your house. I know all of those things because we're in the data business. What we don't do very well is transfer that data and use it in order to deliver that quality of life. So if I may, I'll start with Dan and Rick perhaps because they were the closest to the city of LA. What can the city of LA do in conjunction with the leadership, small wins culture in order to help Eric to steer the ship towards more data and performance management? I can Dan? start. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we've been obviously, you know, working with the, the research team to identify places where we can focus. Um, we've been trying to deploy a, you know, a, a real bright spot um, type of approach where we, long lines of what what Rick was talking about here of co coalition of the willing. Uh, we need to build the momentum that can get other people on board and make it clear what it is that, that people are joining so that people can see somebody else that they know um, that either is from a different department or from their own department. Uh, they can understand what it is that we're talking about here. Um, there's, you know, I spoke a little bit about how people have a lot of misunderstandings. A lot of people have things that they want to change but don't really believe that anybody will listen to them. Um, and so if we can build a in something that we are working towards, uh, a network uh, of you know, performance managers across different departments so that they can see how it worked in another department, uh, they can see what kind of resources they were able to get, and if we can also uh, maintain that communication with those performance managers so we can see what it is that their, their barriers are, and then we can help to, to build uh, support in from the top because there, you know, it's something that I think we talked a little bit about that, you know, there's a lot of different levels of management here that we're talking about. And we only really have control over, over the top and then, and then the general manager level because the rest is all civil service. Um, a lot of these, a lot of department staff haven't really been engaged. Uh, you know, we, Scott brought up a lot of these ideas that, that uh, you know, maybe their general managers haven't, haven't had the resources or the time to put against uh, training or just building this type of culture uh, and we haven't give, been able to give them the resources to do that but we can give the general manager the priority the mandate to actually do something and so if we can hear down on the bottom level from through various meetups that we're doing through innovation uh, grants that we fund with our innovation fund through awards what kinds of things the, the, the people at the, at, the, at the lower levels are looking to do we can then uh, you know direct the, the, the leadership at the top to really make, uh, it, you know, to make this an important thing. Because if we just listen to these people at the bottom and say, hey, go forward and do it, they're going to run into roadblocks. And, and as Bob said, you're, they're going to see people, they're going to see that the mayor doesn't really actually know about this or care about this. Everyone's going to see that that's not really the big important thing. There's obviously a million things that people are working on. We can't make everything important. But if we can start to focus on a few things and let, those, let it be seen that somebody can align with, with that building that network. So I think a lot of it really has to do with communication and building up those networks so that we can understand what that, you know, it's almost like, a, you know, connect four. We have to draw the line across uh, multiple levels of, of leadership. And then, and then once you do, it's like, uh, you know, like Tetris, or it all sort of comes together. <laughs> Rick? I want to express a certain degree of humility uh, about this challenge. Los Angeles is such a difficult environment um, to, uh, to achieve success. And so Mayor Garcetti and, 
and uh, Dan's team uh, are to be, that, that's the success they've had is to be appreciated that much more. Um, it, it is um, a place where the media has almost zero interest in, in this story. Um, uh, and in fact, about the only time they have an interest is when they've identified a problem, uh, and, uh, like, like the dirty streets. And then they'll give you some credit for working on the problem that they discovered. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the uh, political class um, are focused on you know, symbolic issues, fighting Donald Trump, passing resolutions, uh, you know, fo focusing on social issues over which local government has almost no control, but which, um, which plays to the, to the base of political activists that, that um, have a tendency to have disproportionate power in a city with as little public engagement as the city of Los Angeles. So it's an incredibly difficult challenge. Um, I think that uh, Chris and Robert probably have put their finger on, on some of the key things. It's not so much that there's some magic answer out there. It's doubling down and focusing in on the things that have already worked. Um, getting department heads and empowering them to use this tool for 10 years the LAPD had a world-class example of successful management of resources through CompStat. People came from Turkey and Chile and Belgium to come look at how LAPD was deploying its resources and to see, because their idea was, oh, CompStat, that's what cops do. But the four principles of CompStat do not say anything about crime, they do not say anything about law enforcement, they do not say anything about police. They say you start with timely and accurate data. You develop effective tactics. You rapidly deploy resources to implement those tactics. And then you analyze what happened and you relentlessly follow up to continue the, the process. Nothing about crime, nothing about police, nothing about law enforcement. It works in aging, it works in the zoo, from A to Z. Those four principles are basic to getting a job done. They drove down the murder rate in the city of Los Angeles from 1,200 a year to 200 and change. So we actually managed to break through that. We, we forced all 34 department heads to go to a CompStat meeting. And they thought, well, this is pretty intimidating. Well, it had been going on for 10 years, right? They were pretty good at it. And so we had to tell people, it's going to take you a while to get as good as LAPD. That's OK. They weren't that great when they started either. But it is really not rocket science, right? It is really basic. It is timely and accurate data. Develop effective tactics. Rapidly deploy your resources analyze what happened, and relentlessly follow up. This is not rocket science. And so I don't think there's a magic answer, but I think that making that a basic principle, and I apologize for the non-academic language, <laughs> but you know what? It frustrates me that four million people have to put up with substandard services every single day because of lack of willingness to change the way we deploy a budget of 7.2 billion people in the way 55,000 people spend their time. Public service is incredibly important. And if we think that getting somebody's underwear to them in 48 hours on Amazon is important, <laughs> then getting somebody to, to respond to a heart attack in 4.8 minutes is even more important, I would argue. And we spend billions of dollars in this society on things like Super Bowls. And we're spending billions of dollars not delivering the best. And, and it should be more important to get police to where crime is than to get linebackers you know, to, to, to where the ball is. It's incredibly important what public service does and we've got to really be good at it. And so that's my advice.
But I truly uh, agree with your passion about this, and, and you're so right that sometimes we lose perspective uh, in some of the things that we do in public administration, and, and I really appreciate those comments. Bob, any uh, wisdom? Yeah, I would um, argue that the key is comparative data. The useful thing that you have is you have a big city. And that means you're not running it out of one police department or one sanitation shed. You have a bunch of different units. And um, one of the things, there are several things that tell me why this latest effort at performance management started in policing. And one of the reasons is police didn't have to figure out how to collect data. They've been collecting data for uh, 30 or 40 years since um, the police chiefs actually of the world went to the FBI and say, please, we need something that ended up being called uniform um, uh, criminal data. Um, and the advantage that they had, New York um, City has 76 precincts, now it has 77. Um, the advantage is that there was no precinct commander who could get away with the usual bureaucratic excuse. You don't understand we're different. Because there was another precinct someplace in New York that was just the same. And so if your precinct is doing well, and your precinct looks more or less demographically like my precinct, and my precinct isn't doing well, I don't have an excuse. So I, I don't know how many subunits there are in LA, and I suspect that different departments naturally have different subunits. They don't draw the lines all the same. The federal government doesn't do that either. Um, but you can compare the data, and you can set targets for those organizations, those subunits, and then you can reward any unit, not just the best unit, any unit that accomplishes something significant. Um, do they make their target or don't they? And make sure that everybody understands uh, what the reward is. I was uh, once having a conversation with Martin O'Malley uh, when he was still mayor of Baltimore, and, and um, he said, oh, I was having breakfast with my um, Chamber of Commerce buddies the other day, and one of them said to me, Mr. Mayor, that looked like garbage men in your box at the Orioles baseball game the other night. And O'Malley said, yes. They had found a really good sanitation unit. And they gave them the mayor's box for the night. <laughs> Those guys didn't tell anybody, right? Big secret. Um, I should tell you, by the way, since I've been in the mayor's box, they serve more than lemonade. <laughs> um, they were always at every city stat meeting, they were looking for somebody who had done a good job to make sure that they got some sort of attention and reward and thanks. Um, so if you have a large enough city where you have subunits, you can set targets, you can see who's doing well, see who's not doing well, help the ones that aren't doing well. But if you have a level of performance that you expect, everybody should win, not just the top guys. The usual way we play the game is with sports metaphors. One team wins, everybody else loses. This is, creates a human problem. Um, you all remember the um, town of Lake Wobegon? All the women are, come on, strong. strong. All the men are good looking. <coughs> And above average, right? Um, so this is a problem because all those children who went to Lake Wobegon High School hated the cold. And they moved to LA and they work for you. <laughs> <laughs> and they all think they're above average. So if you say, oh, this guy's the winner and everybody else is the losers, they don't like you. But if you set the bar and say, oh, we make the bar, we win, whatever winning means, whether it's the gold ribbon or um, lunch or something. Um, but don't just give it to the top team. Make sure every team that makes your standard uh, wins. And by the way, maybe then they'll be willing to share some secrets. 
you yet? Thank you. Um, you write that report. I like that idea. So I think I, I was really struck by the fact that this idea of having the meetup um, groups and really helping, because I think that's what's been powerful and kind of keep, and I keep coming back to Sacramento as well, because I think that you can, you know, sort of transfer some ideas from one place to the next. And you really do see in Sac and I think this is true probably in LA as well, what we're seeing in Sacramento is that you have some champions of performance approaches and they don't tend to stay in the same department. And so one of the challenges that has happened in Sacramento is that you have a champion, they're super successful, and then they leave. So that's happened in LA. <laughs> um, and so the question then is how do you try and keep a network together so that you, because if you can't rely on individuals, you have to rely on networks because networks can kind of hold this together. And so I think if you have these groups that can provide support for one another and then also provide sharing of experiences, both frustrations and also success stories. And then, and then the trick is when folks leave to try and fire, if they're moving across departments, to try and figure out how you can keep what then becomes a fragile reform going. Because that's, I think, one of the challenges that we've seen in Sacramento, where there have been agencies that were making great progress and then the champion left was usually sort of a mid high level manager um, not the not the ho highest manager and then things just kind of start limping along um, so I think that's that's one of the things that I would say the needs you know looking at this in LA is to try and figure out who your champions are and think about how you can try to institutionalize some of this so that when they leave that whole department doesn't kind of go to pieces. And I, Ashley was saying that they're trying to do training that's more unit focused. So if you can kind of create more capital within, human capital within the department so that it isn't so leader dependent is another way of trying to get at this. The other comment I wanted to make, which is the data piece, this is something that Bob spoke to, it's kind of interesting, is I think and this speaks to the idea that, well, the, the, depart the police department has data, and how do you figure out what data you're going to collect? And we saw this with some cases in LA where people, this actually happened with the State Water Resources Control Board. They spent about a year or two trying to get folks at the regional level to collect data. And there was a lot of paranoia. Again, this kind of idea, well, if they're gonna measure us, and what are they trying to measure? And they're trying to get us to measure different things. And finally, they decided, well, let's just have them give us the data that they already collect and move from there. And then they were able to do some analysis and, sh and identify some of the regional folks who were doing a really good job. And then they were able to connect those folks to the other regions. So that, again, this is Bob's point about comparative, you know, trying to identify who the folks are who are successful, not only just to celebrate them, but also they were able to actually share some of the practices that they were using for, there's a lot of process improvement with some of the, some of the regions that were having more trouble. So I think um, rather than, and this is gets, again, supports Bob's point, if you're doing strategic planning, often it takes you towards measuring something completely different than what you're already measuring and getting from where you are to there is really hard to do. And so I think starting where you are and then thinking about building incrementally is probably a more successful approach. So I wanted to sort of put that, and I don't know if there are particular departments where you know, there's just a need to try to get them to put more, more data together that they already have as opposed to trying to push them towards mm -hmm. collecting new data. I think that can be helpful. Good advice, thank you, Juliette. Uh, any uh, additional wisdom, Scott? Just on that note, this notion of survivability, um, once that leader is gone, that champion is gone, if the focus uh, on, on the data-driven management goes with him or her, then that, that lift becomes that much more significant for the next person that tries because the, the power of the status quo and the folks that are invested in it for at least another generation is such that, in, at least in my experience, 
that, that if, if you know, you're going to go charge at that windmill and ultimately don't succeed, then that notion, that culture of cynicism just gets reinforced. And of course, nothing's ever going to change. And it becomes that much harder for the next person to try. So if you are going to embark on that effort, make sure you know what you're getting into and calibrate the expectations of, of policymakers accordingly. In this case, it's probably both a, a blessing and a curse that it's the mayor's office that wants to uh, move in, in this direction. It's good in that it has policy power behind it. It's bad in that you know, when the shiny keys come out and distract you, you're trying to keep people focused on what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, I would tell you that for those of you who work in a council manager environment, that it, it can't just be tied, it can't be the flavor of the month. It has to be something that ultimately gets incorporated into the culture and is, has survivability. Uh, thank you, Scott. We have about 26 minutes or so in our time, so I'm going to ask our panelists in the next uh, <coughs> round, perhaps, to uh, shorter answers, because I'd love to uh, have the, uh, uh, the audience uh, ask questions, perhaps, the last 15, 20 minutes of this uh, dialogue, if we don't mind. But uh, staying on LA uh, still, and before I get to the transfer of the innovation subject matter that I brought up, uh, perhaps on, on LA, could we then focus uh, um, on the, perhaps, the civil servants and the rank and file that, that came up, for example? Kudos to uh, uh, the Haynes Foundation. Bill Resch and I, our colleague and I, are doing another piece of research, funded also by the Haynes Foundation, about the, the state of the service. One of the things that I thought about is going to the unions to talk about what we were doing in order for us to get buy-in from the unions to get their rank and file educated with respect to the subject matter. Do you think that in this particular piece, there is a role for the unions to play uh, in order for the rank and file uh, to also perhaps um, be not only educated, but also willingly participate to some of this uh, 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 work in performance management? Rick or uh, Dan? Yes and no. Um, I mean, I see a role for the unions to play. Uh, unions have to see a role for them to play. That's that's the key. And um, um, I think it would take an enlightened union leader in the city of Los Angeles to look beyond the typical expectation of protect everyone uh, and focus in on uh, more pay um, to to focus in on what I think the vast majority of people would would be really interested in, which is the quality of work life. Um, I can't, I'm sure it's improved over the last couple of years, um, but for, um, for most people working in the city of Los Angeles, pretty dreary. Um, the facilities are, are out of date, the equipment is out of date, um, the, the um, culture is, Boss knows best, top down, drop everything if a council member calls. Um, never enough money, never enough staff. Um, and you gotta do that 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year for the rest of your career. Um, I, I would think if I were a union, I'd be very interested in having an impact on that, that my members would care about what happens then, not just what I get at the end of the paycheck. I'm not sure. You could pay me enough to put up with some of the frustrations um, that, that folks have to put up with inside um, LA city government. But I did not see that come from union leaders. Um, I don't think it's because they're um, unenlightened or um, I just think that uh, they, they see their role uh, as fighting for pay and benefits and, and keeping the status quo. And, uh, and in fact, not even the status quo. Let's go back to 1984, right? That, that's when everything was good. And, if, and so I, I haven't seen that kind of enlightened leadership from, uh, from union leaders. Dan, any quick comments? I don't think I can really add much more to that. I mean, I, I think, I don't know if, if uh, there's anything else that we've been having conversations. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a challenging topic to get into, but I think it is a. I think it is something that we want to explore more. And I, I was going to say very, very much along the same lines as Rick. I know nothing about labor relations in L.A., um, but I don't think the labor relations in New York City are any different than L.A. Um, there's going to be equally aggressive unions, and 
um, I remember a couple guys who took over the department of um, Bureau of Motor Vehicles. These were the guys that fixed the sanitation trucks. And so they go and they want to do some things to improve the improvement of the sanitation trucks. And they get said, well, you know, uh, we need a Coke machine. Air conditioning doesn't work in the summer. Heating doesn't work in the winter. And um, the toilets aren't very functional either. This is a test. They have asked this of your five predecessors. They have done nothing. And they, have to, they will decide whether they're going to cooperate with you, depending on whether you provide them with what is a reasonable request. Um, they did and began to um, actually have it so that the sanitation trucks were available when it was time to uh, pick up the um, pick up the trash. Uh, it had been a big issue um, in the 70s that the trash was not getting picked up in New York. And they got the mechanics to the stage where the mechanics actually, um, they, the drivers of the trucks, which were not the same union, of course, than the mechanics, the drivers of the trucks would never, um, never check the oil before they went off which would men mean that they would burn out engines every once in a while. How were they going to fix that problem? Actually, the sanitation mechanics fixed the problem and got a patent for a device that would tell you when you were running too low on oil and shut the engine off. And uh, then the drivers quickly figured out, well, maybe we uh, shouldn't uh, take it out without checking the oil. So, I think you've got to meet them on their terms first. I have no, not, I don't know any deal about LA. I just can tell you New York. In Santa Monica, where we have a different kind of a union structure. Um, we have a very different relationship. I meet every other month with the union leadership for an hour and a half, and we, we're not negotiating. We're talking about these kinds of issues. Uh, and one of the most enlightened uh, folks is uh, the Brotherhood of the Teamsters, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's nothing inherent about union leadership. I just think that the city of Los Angeles' current union leadership is not focused on these issues. All right. In the interest of time, now 20 minutes left. So what I'll, I'll save the, the innovation transfer topic to last. So let me turn to you and so that uh, you can ask your questions. And if we can uh, provide short answers <coughs> so we can take as many questions as possible. And then at the end, we'll focus on perhaps if we have time, I hope we do, on the innovation transfer topic. Anyone with a question to our panelists? Dan. Uh, first of all, a lot of sage advice and wisdom, of course, and I appreciate that. One of the things you mentioned frequently early on was the difference between outcomes and, and uh, uh, outputs. And the comment was, you know, we work outputs, but we're interested out all these and so forth. I'm curious, both the researchers of the seven top cities, as well as those of you who are experiencing this, to what extent are cities shifting to actually gauging performance based on outcomes rather than outputs? And to what extent does that back its way into changing the culture? OK, so the question is, how do we move from outputs to outcomes? And I would argue, first of all, that you have to be strategic in the use of performance measures. And in some cases, you actually want to measure not even outputs or outcomes, but processes. So I'm going to use this. Here's an example. One of the issues that, that it's another organization in Sacramento, the Department of State um, Architecture, they actually process permits for school construction. They were getting beaten up because their processes for processing permits were so lengthy. And so they started actually doing very close process mapping. And what they actually learned, which is quite interesting, doesn't help them improve much, but it helps them manage their external environment, is that the reason there were delays is that they would kick the plans back to the architect that was hired by the school district because they needed to make changes so that the schools would be safe. And then it would hang out there for months and months and months. So they were able to document actually that all the, that, that the kind of pushback they were getting from school districts about how they were being too slow was actually not their fault at all. And so it was a strategic use of performance measures. And so I think to th and, and there's some departments where you can re relatively easily measure outputs, but if you're going to try and measure outcomes, 
you know, if you think in the environmental area, there's so many competing explanations as to and uncontrollables that it's almost like a council of despair to try to do that. So I guess I would argue that d depending on the department, you may want, I mean, if you think about a logic model, which people who have had me as a student know I'm always shoving down their throat, you want to actually think about which part of your sort of production process is most important to measure, and that's leadership. Leadership is using these kinds of performance measures strategically as opposed to mechanically. So I'm sorry, that's my little rant about that. Yeah, one thing I just really want to quickly say about outcomes, um, you know, we've found it sometimes hard to measure an outcome across the city that's you know, a big thing like you know, in employment or happiness or anything that you get into the, the, the needs of people. Um, and we really have, have seen a lot more success in shifting to, to uh, equity of outcomes. So you know, especially with the clean stat uh, effort, by, by breaking it down and looking at how does the city compare, neighborhoods compare, then trying to get some equity in that and equity of service delivery can be, can start to move you towards an outcome, even if you're not being able to measure, you know, there might not be a measurable big change in city cleanliness overall that you can, that you can point to, but in certain neighborhoods you can really point to a change. And, then, and so getting a little bit more uh, geographically detailed can help a lot with that. We're embarked in Santa Monica on exactly, this is our focus, is um, taking our well-being index, which measures community outcomes, and linking that to what we do day to day. And there's wisdom in both of what um, Juliet and Dan said. Um, we, we don't have control over community outcomes, but we have impact on them. And we can, we can measure that impact. We can move the needle. When, when uh, Chief Bratton said, I'm gonna reduce crime, he could have blamed um, churches, schools, parents, society, the economy, uh, which is what all the other chiefs were doing. And he said, no, um, I, I am not responsible for crime, but I can help prevent it by the deployment of my resources. I think we have to take that kind of an attitude. We don't, we are not, the source of pollution, we're not the source of crime, we're not the source of fires, um, but we can have an impact uh, on the quality of life and the standard of living in our communities. Um, I, I wanted to ask how you balance the uh, sort of the staff organizational you know, development, the setting of priorities, and then translating that into like developing their agency to actually do something. Um, and how do you balance the setting of priorities that you may get from the quote top and then build the trust that you talked about that I think is really, really important with your staff if we're not going out into the community of residents, right, but with internally to say you actually have a voice in what we're doing and flattening the conical structure that you know others were talking about, which I think is really old. So, um, how, how are you doing that and how are you balancing it? Because there's a lot that comes from quote the top and we have to be able to translate that into practice. The majority of your people, the lower ranks, as a couple of you said, is, you know, it's, it's not, I don't look at it as lower ranks, it's like a circle, it's flat, you know, and there are more of them. So. Let's get the yeah. LA perspective, perhaps, Dan, yeah, and then can, we can ask both sure. Rick and, and Scott uh, as the practitioners, as city managers, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I can go really quickly. The you know, it, a huge uh, push on our side has been to to increase recognition along the lines of what you know Dr. Bain was talking about, getting getting a lot more uh, a, a lot more people recognized, aware of what other what their, their colleagues are doing, build. Um, you know, do more regular awards, regular meetings, regular uh, uh, learning sessions, these kinds of things can really help. But we, I, I think we've just found also again and again being very clear at the top of what the, the di directions are and, and setting an outcome as opposed to the specific expectation of what needs to be done. You know, we don't, we try not to get into too much micromanaging. If you can, but you can be very clear about what you want achieved, then staff at the bottom or low, you know, I don't want to say bottom, the, the, the closer to the, to the, to the, the, the field 
then they can get mobilized around it. If they know what it is that they're trying to do, but, but if you start with a, we want you to go out and do this thing, then they're not going to be as motivated. Right. Around. It's the, the joint agenda setting. Yep. Scott? I would tell you that um, an alignment of, of what you're trying to achieve helps. Uh, in Glendale, we do city council priorities. They have 10 priorities, everything from public safety to health and wellness and you know, arts and culture, all things that are, that are much more, uh, a little bit higher level, um, but those are the things that they want as a community. Every year, every department, all 15 line departments adopt uh, uh, department strategic goals. That is the scorecard basically, and each department is responsible for achieving those goals, and we measure our progress towards them uh, through the key performance indicators. At the end of the year, uh, we will have, uh, if, if, if we have a non-personnel uh, uh, related surplus, meaning you just don't have a surplus because you didn't fill positions, there was really money left over through innovation, through, uh, through uh, just a, a cost cutting, um, and we've achieved more than 75% of the department's strategic goals, um, and we have an index of those key performance, the most important of the key performance indicators. If everything is trending the way that we need it, we allow a 1% gain share for all employees across the entire organization, 1% of base salary, non purgeable non-replicable, non-negotiable with the union. And sometimes it's been 1%, sometimes it's been half a percent, sometimes it's been zero. Uh, but the point being that uh, we're able to say, okay, council wants to get these things done up at this high priority level. We know at a tactical level the types of, ob the types of, of uh, uh, things that we have to get done by way of tasks. And then as a department management group, we know those department strategic goals really should become uh, more outcome focused. If you achieve it, so what? What does that do to contribute towards those priorities? That alignment, that cascading kind of relationship, priorities, goals, and uh, KPIs has served us pretty well these last five years. So who set those KPIs up? Like who, did you set those metrics with them or did you that come from the no, it came from, it, it, that was something that, that came, I, I loved the comment, I forget who, who had said it, about coming from the middle management group. Um, and as we started, it, it took us, I, I kid you not, two years to get good key performance indicators. But then we knew what we were counting, and we were counting it the right way that we could compare acro across time frames. Um, but once we got there, we were able to start cooking with gas at that point. But that came really from that mid-level ranks with su uh, support from the, the management team. Anything to add, Rick? I've spoken a lot, um, but I, um, we had great experience in Los Angeles, uh, starting with the five departments that were the hardest to measure, arguably, which were the five departments uh, under us, which were the internal service departments, right? So we don't provide any direct service, the um, human resources, uh, technology, uh, finance, et cetera. Um, and so uh, we, we went through what I'd candidly described as brain damage of, of forcing the departments to figure out what the key performances are. And, and we literally said the first um, measure was kinder, we start with kindergarten. And, uh, um, cause we were, and, and we asked them all to bring one measure. That's your assignment, bring back one measure. Uh, and we started there. And we built from there with them. Um, and it was incredibly painful and slow. Um, but as, as Scott mentioned, I don't, there's no shortcut to, to doing it. And very, very quickly, because um, uh, we want to move along, but in the finance department, we had remarkable um, results, not because of any bright ideas that came out of Dan's shop, but because Dan taught them, as Ashley is teaching folks, how to, to do this. This is very Socratic. That's what, what I admire about Dr. Ben's approach. Um, the people who are doing the job know how to do it better. We just have to help them figure that out through hard questions, high standards, and empowerment. And the last one is the hardest of all because it's really hard, you know, it's like what the guy, uh, D. Hawk, who invented the Visa card, he said, um, getting new ideas into people's head is not hard. The hard part is getting the old ideas out. And, and, you know, even someone as, as enlightened in practice as Dan has a hard time not saying the top of the organization, right? So do I, right? It's ingrained in us. But what a, what a toxic way to look at human beings, top and bottom. Just speaking to empowerment, I work in healthcare, so 
a lot of the research that I've been involved with in the last 15 years has been using that word differently. It's saying uh, redirecting the pattern back to, you know, because many of the folks that we were working with in the residents said for many, you know, like we were talking about institutional racism or things like that, said you can't give me any power. It's just I have I have no space to tell you what my power was. So they said, redirect it back to me and I'll tell you what's up. So it, it was an interesting thing and then of course, you know, as I think Michigan we wrote about this like a hundred times. You know, but, but it was um, it was eye opening, and I, I didn't come up with that. So. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you, or do you, uh, in LA, incorporate in private sector influence on some of this? Because the private industry has been using data to uh, drive their profits. I mean, profit is obviously the biggest driver, uh, data driver, um, obviously, and then you figure out how to make it, and then you repeat that over and over again, and then those are the really successful people. Um, how do you engage them into your network? Do you incorporate what they do into what we do in government, and how does that influence or has it? I'm trying to think. I mean, for, for certain departments, there's definitely more of a dialogue just because they're interacting with the private sector, or for, you know, for our finance department, they they might regularly meet with, with banks and things to talk through this, this kind of stuff. Um, and we obviously support that and help set that up. Um, we've, we've found generally, uh, you know, go back to the cultural idea and bringing people along with, with them, it, it, it can be kind of intimidating to, to bring in people from a totally different background, especially especially, I don't, I'm trying to think about a diplomatic way to say this, but you know, oftentimes private sector, they're, well, you're trying to sell things <laughs> in the private sector. And so you really want to sell yourself as knowing what you're doing. And we don't want people feeling like that's how they have to act about this, <laughs> if that makes any sense. We want people to actually come to this very, very, hum with a lot of humility and a lot of sense that they're going to make a lot of mistakes. And so I think there's a lot to learn from it, but we don't expect people to model that same kind of attitude or, or idea, you know, that they can, they can come to us very clearly saying they don't know what they're trying to achieve. That, that said, we got about a million dollars worth of free help from McKinsey and Company and about a million dollars from uh, Price Waterhouse um, uh, on our sustainability plan. And, and coming at the very beginning, that was very helpful. Now, Dan is right. There's suspicion and even hostility or what are they trying to sell and they don't know what our life is like, et cetera. But, um, they were remarkably good at, at sort of overcoming that. And I think coming at the early part of the administration, um, I, I would give them a lot of, of credit. And uh, they never really cashed in on it. It genuinely was uh, an effort to, uh, uh, to, to give. And then, um, you know, we, we hired some folks out of the private sector um, for the innovation delivery team. And, um, and, and that was helpful, too. Um, but I think Dan is absolutely right in the end um, folks in government are not going to take private sector advice, um, you know, just undiluted, especially if it's a consultant telling them what to do. And I would like to thank the panel, Frank, and the entire panel for providing this all their insights. Really interesting discussion.